Well, I've entitled my lecture, my paper this morning, uh, as you can see from your program, The Law as Friend and Foe in the Theology of Luther. I think that the, uh, the, uh, the foe part of Luther is probably well known just in terms of uh, the law being that which condemns us before God and drives us to Christ. The, the friend part, maybe not, not so much. Um, that might be an issue that has not been appreciated and drawn out uh, with regard to when we think about Luther uh, and the law. Um, I was going to mention, too, that I don't know if you noticed this morning, that was a perfect hymn, by the way, absolutely perfect. But if you look down at the bottom right of the hymn, I lost the number that we sang this morning, but uh, it was a Wittenberg hymn from 1543. And a lot of the things that we sung about this morning, you're going to hear kind of come out as I kind of go through the course of Luther's writings and talk about uh, his view of the law. And its, its purpose is not only just in the unregenerate or the wicked, uh, the unbeliever, but also its continued work uh, with regard uh, to the believer. Well, Luther is well known for paradoxes in his theology, and you'll see that uh, I kind of wanted to kind of title it this way just to kind of emphasize that paradox, the law as both friend and foe. Probably the most uh, well-known paradox of Luther is this idea that the Christian is simul justus et peccator. The Christian is simultaneously righteous and sinner. And uh, some theologians, Lutheran theologians, want to point out that that does not just refer to the divine verdict of our justification and our forgiveness and our actual condition as sinner, but it also will refer to the anthropological conflict within us, Romans chapter 7, the desires of the spirit that are at enmity and at war with the continual promptings of our sinful nature. So there's that paradox that, that we live out and will live out until the day that we meet Christ and see him face to face and become pure just as he is. So that's a well-known paradox for Luther, uh, with regard to Luther. Another paradox, uh, in 1523, in his work, Freedom of a Christian, and he says that with regard to the believer and his standing before Christ as justified by faith alone, he says the Christian is, quote, utterly free man, Lord of all, subject to none. And then yet, with respect to our duty to love our neighbor, Luther says, quote, a Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. It seems that Luther was comfortable with paradox in his theology, and I think the reason why is because he knew it befuddled our human wisdom. He knew that God in his mystery, in his um, inexhaustible beauty, that, we, that our human wisdom cannot ascend to God in that way. God is beyond our human comprehension, and our natural human wisdom just, it, it, it comes up against an obstacle when it tries to figure these things out. In his articles of the Heidelberg Disputation that were prepared for a meeting of the Augustinian order in 1518, Luther again kind of stresses the paradox, or at least from a human nature side paradox, where we think that we can try and know God through our philosophy, through our speculation, and through our reason. And of course, Luther emphasizes that the knowledge of God is by his revelation and his word, namely the gospel, and primarily, in a sense, and even paradoxically, in the condescension, humiliation, suffering, and weakness of the God-man on the cross. Rather than looking for God through our reason and our own philosophy and trying to understand God, Luther says God has shown himself to us right there, as we heard about last night, the suffering of Jesus Christ on the cross, the weakness of the God-man, Christ glorifying the Father. Also, um, he says that natural human wisdom thinks that we can attain God, and, uh, and it's just kind of wired within us to boast and to desire and to think that we have some part to play, that we can ascend to God through our works and merit his eternal pleasure, what Luther refers to as a theology of glory, where, in fact, Luther says the law accuses us. It works death in us. It kills us. It even causes suffering in us because of our weakness before its demands and its condemnation of our sin. So that we are only declared righteous and made spiritually alive through faith in Christ in the receiving of the unmerited love of God, i.e. what Luther refers to as the theology of the cross. In other words, somewhat paradoxical to our natural human intuition, we do not become righteous by doing more and more righteousness, but by being made or shown to be the sinners that we really are apart from the grace of God 
With regard to Luther's attitude toward the law and the believer, I think we encounter another paradox. In fact, Luther is often sounds duplicitous about when he talks about the law. Sometimes it, talks, it sounds like he's talking out of both sides of his mouth. But again, I think that Luther enjoys that. I think he enjoys just kind of poking at human wisdom a little bit. On the one hand, Luther can praise God's law, namely the, law, the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments, when he says, quote, they are the greatest treasure God has given us. That's what he says in his large catechism of 1530. On the other hand, he can utterly disparage the law to the degree that he says, quote, uh, we cannot speak of it in sufficiently vile and odious terms, which he says in his lectures on Galatians in 1531. In those same lectures, he says that, quote, we should make a god of the law, on the one hand, but in those very same lectures, nay, even in the same passage, he says the law can also be a, quote, devil to us. So what's going on here? How can Luther speak of the law in such seemingly conflicting and paradoxical ways? Before I uh, began work on my dissertation on Luther with regard to the law, I didn't realize how much ink had been spilt on it. I probably should have done a little bit more homework. And realizing, even among con- uh, theologians of the Lutheran confession themselves, have some disagreement with regard to what exactly Luther thought of the law with regard to the Christian life and what to call it. Certain statements of Luther do kind of give the impression that... Um, that he was entirely or mostly negative about the law as it had to do with the Christian life. And uh, I, didn't, I think I left my quote down there, but John Wesley was very critical. He, you know, the story goes that John Wesley was converted through, by hearing the epistle, uh, uh, Luther's preface to Romans in, um, in England. But then and he read Luther's lectures on Galatians in 1741, and he said, oh, Luther, he just keeps talking about the law and the death and, and the devil and the works, and he just talks about how Christ has redeemed us from the law. And, and for Wesley, he, he considered Luther as part of the reason why the Moravians uh, were very passive in their active moral discipline. And uh, that was an issue that Wesley had to deal with. So he was very critical of, with regard to Luther's view of the law. What is known among some Lutherans, and I would say probably all Reformed, as the uh, third use of the law, that is the function of the law, the special function that it has in the life, in guiding the moral life of the believer, is formally attributed to Luther's friend first, Philip Melanchthon. He's the kind of the first one to, to actually use the phrase third use of the law, or Tertius uses legis. And of course, this use was developed by, later by John Calvin in the Reformed tradition, and within the Reformed tradition, it becomes the principal use of the law. But there has been much debate about whether there is a place and what place there is in Luther's theology for a positive function for the moral law in the life of the believer. Some Luther scholars have developed different phrases to distinguish a convicting and condemning work associated with the law from its more positive function as a guide for the Christian life. Thus, Paul Althaus, who's written a classic work on the theology of Martin Luther, which I still think is very good. He distinguishes in that work and another work, especially the gazettes or the law that condemns from the gabot or the commands of Jesus that exhort the believer. Other scholars uh, talk about an exhortational office of the law or a practical use of the gospel or evangelical or gospel precepts as to distinguish it from the law. However, uh, scholars, including Althaus, agree that the practical teachings of Jesus agree in every sense with the Ten Commandments, and thus for Luther even, in a general sense, constitute law as the communication revelation of God's will. Well, my studies of this uh, issue, two principal things emerged for me that, are, that I felt like are very important to keep in mind whenever we read Luther with regard to the law and try to understand sometimes his paradoxical language, where he can uphold the law with such um, admiration and such extolling, and on the other hand, talk very disparagingly about it. And I think the two things are, first, it's absolutely connected to the paradox of the believer as uh, simultaneously righteous and sinner. It's very, very crucial to understand when he's speaking about the law with regard to that paradox itself. Secondly, it's also necessary to always understand the polemical context 
an occasion in which Luther is writing about the law. Uh, and this is an emphasis, you know, we talk about interpreting scripture by scripture. I think it's fair to say we need to interpret Luther by Luther. And not just take isolated statements out of Luther, but say, who's he writing against? What's the occasion? And make sure we understand how he's defining terms. Because at one point in one of his writings, he says, Moses has nothing to do with us, but you have to understand what he's saying and who he's writing against. So just like we would treat the scriptures, it's very easy to lift. And, and Luther was very much, he didn't write a, an entire, other than maybe the catechism, I guess, could come closest, as a, a, a systematic theology, kind of like a Calvin's Institutes. He was very pastoral, always writing on occasions with letters and treaties and responding to things. So you always have to take that into consideration. So the, the paradox of the believer is simultaneously righteous and sinner and the polemical occasion context. For example, we've already heard about the antinomians. They also troubled the German parishes in the early, late 1520s and early 1530s. Antinomian, uh, anti-nomos, anti-law. There were those who, in some manner, influenced by Luther, went to an extreme they argue that the Ten Commandments don't need to be preached or taught in churches, but only the gospel. In fact, one of those who was preaching this way was Luther's own friend, Johann or John Agricola. Very, very close friends. But they had a falling out over this issue. There's indeed statements in some of Luther's early writings that, isolated from their context, taken to extreme, could be implied applied in an antinomian way, and the antinomians were fond to say, hey, we're on Luther. This is what Luther said. Okay? But in fact, in addressing the problem of antinomianism later in the 1530s, and we'll come back to this later, Luther admits that in the early years, his emphasis did fall on being more negative about the law in order to counter the burdensome preaching of works righteousness by the monks, the bishops, the popes, and the theologians for the sake of the gospel. But now... As we heard already, the antinomians were going too far in the other direction. And they were compromising the impact of the gospel by neglecting to preach and to teach the law in the churches. Listen to what Luther says. He says, Now, however, when the times are very dissimilar from those under the Pope, our antinomians, those suave theologians, retain our words, our doctrines, the joyful tidings concerning Christ, and wish to preach this alone— not observing that men are other than they were under that hangman, the Pope, and have become secure, forward, wicked violators, yea, Epicureans who neither fear God nor men. In those days, referring to the early days, around you know, before 1520, we were terrorized so that we trembled even at the fall of a leaf. But now our softly singing antinomians, paying no attention to the change of times, make men secure who are of themselves already so secure that they fall away from grace. If you see the afflicted and contrite, preach grace as much as you can. If they're already down, don't kick them down further. But not to the secure, the slothful, the harlots, adulterers, and blasphemers. Luther will say, that's when the law is needed. And we should keep in mind that Luther lived during the age of estate-established churches. So you probably had a lot of the slothful, the harlots, adulterers, and blasphemers in the, in the midst of the congregation. Law and gospel was very important to Luther. I mean, it was a, a basic part of his hermeneutic of understanding the scriptures. Another, and he said that you could not really understand the scriptures unless you understand that proper distinction of law and gospel. If you fail in it, you will, you will misread, the, misread the scriptures, he said. It's very important to have that distinction. He said it's very important to be a skilled, masterful theologian to properly understand what is law and what is gospel. In fact, uh, last year at a conference I spoke with regard to uh, Luther and his influence on the English reformers, especially with regard to the prologues and prefaces that he added. And one of the questions I guess I was trying to uh, think about or consider was, Luther, if the scriptures are so perspicuous and so clear with regard to the message. And you translate the scriptures for the people and they can read and see the truth for themselves. Why include all the prefaces? Why include all the prologues? And uh, I kind of, I guess, as I did some more thinking about it, I think for Luther, he had to reorient people. People had been trained and taught a certain way and you had to completely shift 
their way of thinking when they hear certain passages of Scripture, not to think that, uh, that they could achieve salvation by their works or to hear this passage and therefore this means that, um, you know, that salvation is by obedience. So he was really trying to reorient the German people to think about law and gospel differently and to read and hear the Scriptures differently. Antinomianism did not only impact the Lutheran church, it also reared its head and challenged English and American Puritans. And wouldn't you know it, Luther was a topic of conversation again. Well, what I want to do with my remaining time this morning is to kind of walk you through some of Luther's writings and kind of break it up into three historical periods. Again, kind of putting Luther's thought in its context. First of all, I want to deal with 1513 to 1519. These are really Luther's years, the evangelical breakthrough concerning the doctrine of justification by faith alone, particularly through his lectures in the Bible. Secondly, 1520 to about 1526, this is a period of where Luther is writing many evangelical treatises and sermons as the Reformation in Germany is underway and developing and evolving and as he's responding to various issues. In certain ways, the Reformation was moving in ways that he had not anticipated or expected or desired. And then thirdly, 1527 to 1539, these are the periods where Luther is drafting his large and small catechisms and also uh, really kind of the um, significant uh, confrontation that he had with antinomians within the Lutheran churches and, as I mentioned, even among his own friend. My intention is to illuminate Luther's paradoxical theology of the law as both a friend and a foe in the Christian life, always being careful to interpret Luther and be fair to him in his context. So first period, 15, 1513 to 1519, this is Luther's time as a member of the Augustinian order, especially his lectures on the Bible that he delivered following his doctorate. We don't have time to develop Luther's biography, but it's, it's fascinating. Um, it's one of the things that drew me to Luther uh, in the first place uh, was just his life, you know? Um, just a fascinating life. And... Uh, Certainly a flawed individual, of course, but uh, just a real fascinating story of his struggle and his anxiety before God, um, the conviction that he came that salvation was by faith alone, and just the impact, the remarkable impact that his theology touched in so many areas of German religious life, cultural life, social life, obviously his, his uh, marriage to Katharina von Bora, just a fascinating life uh, to study. And unlike some other theologians, he definitely did wear his heart on his sleeve, which makes it even more interesting, but... We don't have time to delve into that biography, but I don't want us to miss the fact that Luther entered that monastery, that cloister in Erfurt in 1505, in order to seek assurance of his salvation. In the medieval period, you looked up to the monks. They were the true spiritual heroes. And if you really wanted to get serious about religion, you joined the monastery. And Luther, you know, uh, we know, of course, the lightning storm story, and he made a vow to St. Anne he was going to become a monk to achieve that salvation. So if you want to get serious about God, then that's where you go. You join the monastery. That's what he did. But we know from the biographies and the stories, I'm sure you've, you've read or heard, that the opposite happened. Rather than drawing closer to God through all of his monastic zeal, and Luther believed that there, if there ever was a monk that could get to heaven by being a monk, he was the one. That's how zealous he was, far beyond even his own fellow monks and maybe even his own superiors at the monastery. But he felt, he felt like he was falling further away from God because his righteous demands seemed so impossible and beyond reach. So Luther experienced all kinds of bouts of spiritual anxiety, depression, despair, anger toward God, that lovely long German word, anfechtungen, just this spiritual anxiety that couldn't be quelled no matter what. And he availed himself of all that the church gave to him. Uh, but they, they couldn't do it. He fasted um, more than all the others, deprived himself, he conf uh, the conf his time in the confessional is certainly well known, and that was a place where he was supposed to receive some absolution, some comfort, a place where humble sinners could receive. But this only made his troubles worse, because Luther doubted whether his confessions were sincere enough. And there are stories that Luther confessed for hours, and he'd walk away from the confessional, and he'd come back because he forgot something. Or he'd confess all of his motives and his inclinations, and of course, you know, it's known that at one point, his superiors said, come back and confess something real, you know, a real sin. Um, but that wasn't sufficient for Luther. He wanted to confess all of it. He, he was scared. He was afraid before God. And he knew that his righteous standards were impossible. And that, that, those, debouts, those bouts of depression uh, and angst, they affected his health later in life. Maybe part of the reason why he had so many 
health issues in his stomach was just the, the stress that he was under. Well, the monastic superior, Johann von Staupitz, encouraged him in many ways to try and distract Luther. Luther was sent to Rome on mission for the Augustinian order, but he got to Rome and um, that great city, you know, where the Pope resided and just basically came back still very uh, just um, disappointed. Uh, his superior also encouraged Luther to pursue his doctorate and to lecture on the Bible at the recently established University of Wittenberg, partly, I think, to distract Luther, to keep him busy, to keep him from navel-gazing too much. You've got you to get busy, Luther. You're, just, you're thinking too, too deeply about these things. But while preparing these lectures, especially in the book of Romans, and while reading the works of Augustine, Luther came to understand that the righteousness of God in Romans 1 is not the standard by which God will judge us on the last day, which is what Luther had been taught in his medieval train, was that was what the righteousness of God is speaking of there. It's the standard by which we have to conform ourselves to the last day. Luther comes to understand the righteousness of God as a gift from God, given in Christ alone, received through faith alone. As Bishop Augustine had argued in his dispute with the Pelagians in the early 5th century, Luther stresses in his lectures on Romans that the law was not given to sinners because they can keep it, but so they might come to terms with their helplessness and be driven to Christ to be justified by grace. Luther talks about in the lectures on Romans that to keep the law outwardly by compulsion and under restraint and even for hope of reward is not to truly keep the law. He describes these works as works of the law, and they are under the dominion of sin and not worthy to be called merit before God, because they're still self-focused. They're not focused on the glory of God, and they're not focused purely on the neighbor's need and good. They're still focused on your self-preservation, avoiding punishment or receiving reward. And for Luther, that does not constitute a purely good work. So Luther attacks the confidence falsely placed in obligatory and compelled obedience as justifying. And as I mentioned, Luther would even come to realize during this period that repentance itself, leading to faith, is a gift of God's grace to prepare for justification. As he had been taught by his late medieval theologians and by a particular one, Gabriel Beale, that man in their own natural will can repent and desire after God, and God then rewards us with the grace that we then need to go on to merit eternal life. But Luther says even the act of repentance itself is a work of God in the heart, drawing us to himself. So Luther came during this period to identify the distinct and proper role of the law, that is referring to the moral law of the Ten Commandments in accordance with natural law, not all the old covenant laws of Moses for Jews, But the proper rule of the law is not the rule of conformity by which a person is made acceptable to God, but that which makes conscious of sin leading to justification by faith in the alien righteousness of Christ. In his disputation against scholastic theology around the same time in 1517, Luther stresses against the influence of Aristotle's uh, philosophy into medieval theology that the law of God and the natural will are at enmity with each other. In truth, the natural self being honest with itself, would wish God and the law away. Obeying under compulsion, under restraint, or hope of reward, the natural self wishes God and the law did not exist. So that it could indulge its fleshly desires fully, without sorrow, without repentance, without harm, and without consequence. So Luther, again, righteousness cannot be about doing more and more and more righteousness, as Aristotle taught. You practice virtue in order to become virtuous, Aristotle had said. But it's about a spiritual transformation wrought by the work of God in the soul, by the gospel, by the Holy Spirit. Luther would often use the analogy of a tree and its fruit to illustrate that a person must first be made righteous in spirit before the fruit of their works are righteous. It's not the apple that makes the tree, it's the, it's the tree that makes the fruit, the apple. You have to reroot the tree, or recreate the tree in a sense, in order for the fruit to be uh, productive, righteous. In his Heidelberg Disputation of 1518, Luther states that Christ's suffering on the cross shows our utter helplessness before the law to be justified, and the foolishness of glorying in human works of righteousness, that God had to go to that extent to rescue us through the humiliation and suffering of his own 
Son, afflicted on the cross. That's what it took to rescue us, is itself a preaching against salvation by works of the law. God had to come to us and to that level of degradation to lift us up. He says in the Heidelberg Disputation, the law says, do this, which we cannot do in ourselves. The gospel says, believe this, which has already been done for us in Christ. Yet Luther says God still uses that law so that sinners will recognize sin. Now, freed from the law's condemnation, the believer in Christ is empowered by the Holy Spirit to obey the law gladly and willingly from the heart, a sincere obedience that cannot be extorted by a mere external law. You cannot extort from a sinful nature by a mere written law true virtue, true obedience. That only comes through the power of the Holy Spirit, through faith in Christ. Yet Luther is quick to maintain that even these works possess no merit before God because justification has already been established in Christ. And it's from this faith that flows out good works as the spiritual fruits of grace. Luther says that the uh, sufferings of Christ in the cross, they can invoke repentance and sorrow for sin and contrition. We think what, what Christ suffered for us. But he says that is not the proper work of the cross. And he says Christ himself taught the law to the apostles. That was not his primary office or function. And so Luther begins to make an important distinction between the ministry of the law and the ministry of the gospel in their proper sense. And even relative to the dispensation before and after Christ's first coming. In his second Psalms lectures begun in 1518, Luther describes how the Old Testament Mosaic Covenant was primarily, though not exclusively, and I emphasize not exclusively, an age defined by the preaching of the law with threats of wrath. Similarly, the teaching of faith and grace belongs properly, though not exclusively, to the age following the full revelation of Christ and his fulfillment in his atoning death. In his lectures on Hebrews and his lectures on Galatians, same period, Luther describes the office of the Christian priest or pastor as properly the preaching of the gospel and the fulfillment of the law in Christ, though acknowledging that the law must also still be preached to lead sinners to faith. Again, pointing to the fact that Christ and the apostles themselves taught good works in accordance with the moral law of Moses. It's important, however, to stress that the preaching of the law in the present age following the coming of Christ is on account of the unbelieving, the wicked, and even the sinful nature that remains with believers until the resurrection. In his lectures on Romans, this is where he develops that idea. The believer is righteous in Christ, and through the presence and activity of the Spirit, all remain a sinner in his natural self. Although the conscience is free from the condemnation law through faith, the sinful nature, we all know from personal experience, does not disappear and wars against the desires of the Spirit that flow from faith. So although a believer by the Spirit no longer fully consents to such sinful impulses, those sinful impulses remain nonetheless. And a believer's works are always tainted with sin, insofar as there is any hint of reluctance, hesitancy, or unwillingness. And Luther will say that when we we are with Christ, before Christ, then our obedience will be perfect in terms of without hesitation, without opposition, without any hesitancy. But on this side of heaven, those works are harder to come by. There's always going to be some kind of reluctance or hesitancy or pride even in our works. Even our best works are tainted, this side of heaven. But in in heaven, our obedience will be made complete and perfect. According to a, a Paul Althaus, that Luther, uh, Luther scholar, he says this paradox in Luther's thought, quote, characterizes not only the paradoxical theological and empirical togetherness of the divine verdict and man's actual condition, but also the anthropological conflict within the Christian man, end quote. And for Luther, this is again what the Apostle Paul is describing in Romans 7. So Luther can speak ideally of good works that flow spontaneously from faith in the believer as if there's no need for the law. But his theology of the Christian as still simultaneously righteous and sinner also means that there is no Christian perfection. And faith itself is not perfected in this life prior to the resurrection. In fact, in his lectures on Galatians in 1519, he says, quote, 
uh, the Ten Commandments are necessary only for sinners. But then he quickly adds, the righteous too are sinners. Therefore, the righteous still need the Ten Commandments. Luther says that the good works taught by Christ and the apostles, which are deeper explanations of the law, not only expose the inward nature of sin more clearly, but also serve believers as, quote, aids and observances for their faith that has only begun in a believer in his process of redemptive healing. Although you could say faith itself by the Spirit requires no laws, requires no exhortations, requires no instructions to good works in and of itself, there is no believer this side of heaven who fully possesses faith, lives in that faith perfectly moment by moment without any sinful impulses of the flesh, with no further need of the law. Luther uses the analogy of a horse and its rider. He says, a bridle is needed for the horse, not the rider. And in the analogy, faith is the rider. The horse is the sinful nature, and the bridle is the law. That's why we need the law. Not because of faith, but because of the sinful nature. Faith is there, but you know that horse sometimes wants to go its own way. And that's why the law is needed. He also talks about the law as a custodian, coming from Galatians 3.24, that before faith, before faith uh, the law acts as a tutor, compelling a child to outward obedience. But now that same custodian, and here he says, that same custodian of the law has become, quote, a friend. A friend because the believer has the inward desire and delight of the Holy Spirit and no longer cons- consents to those impulses of the flesh. Not fully, not without repentance. And so his delight is in the law. The law is a friend to him. So long as the believer continues to wage war against sin and repents if he should fall, therefore not fully consenting in his heart to sin, Luther says he is covered and justified by faith in Christ. This is, a, this is the ongoing battle against sin that defines the life of the believer. So this battle against sin while resting completely by faith in Christ for justification is for Luther what it looks like to live out God's covenant made at baptism until the day of resurrection. And Luther does talk about baptism as a covenant. And I would say that his, this, this idea of battling against sin is part of the, the evidence, that fruit, even of his theology of predestination. It's those who continue. Of course, there's no Christian perfection. There's no perfect faith. But there will be that daily mortification of sin, that daily battle that goes on in the life of the believer, all the while resting upon Christ for complete and full justification before God. So let's look at the next period, 1520 to 1526. Of course, one of the initial criticisms by Luther's opponents of his theology was that it would seem to negate the need to preach the law or to urge good works, and thus would lead to lawlessness. In his work, Freedom of a Christian, 1520, Luther had addressed this by arguing that true faith by its very nature, as we've already heard in previous uh, sermons and lectures, produces the fruits of good works. But Luther also realized that not everyone in the churches truly believes, and therefore the law continues to serve a purpose in constraining the wicked to outward obedience for the sake of the common good, and also to humble sinners to repentance for justification in Christ. We heard both of those in the hymn. I don't know if you noticed But both of those were in the hymn this morning. The idea of restraining the wicked for the common good, but also that sense of bringing to repentance to be justified by Christ. These are the seeds of what Luther would later call in the 1530s, formally, the usus legis, the uses of the law. In the freedom of a Christian, he says, on the one hand, faith fulfills the first commandment and all the other commandments that spring from it because faith is the fountain of obedience. But the Christian still has an outer man, a sinful nature, that remains resistant and hostile to the Spirit of God and needs to be actively put under subjection to the law. And when I, I do need to emphasize that when Luther talks about the flesh, the outer man, he's not just talking about the physical body, he's talking about all the inclinations of the sinful person, spirit, flesh, body, all of it, everything that is oriented away from God towards self. Luther extols the Ten Commandments throughout the 1520s. Beginning in 1520, he published a work entitled A Treatise on Good Works, in which he exposits the Ten Commandments as the definition of good works and the form of life most pleasing to God, especially in contrast to all the works the medieval Roman church was urging and teaching. Fasts, pilgrimages, penances, prayers. He says, if you want to look for a life that is well-pleasing to God, study the Ten Commandments. That's Luther said. In fact, he refers to the Ten Commandments as ein Spiegel, a mirror, better than any other to know what we lack and what we should seek for in the will of God. 
Luther also uh, wrote hymns uh, extolling the Ten Commandments in the 1520s. Just two examples are, These are the Holy Ten Commands, and man wouldst thou live all blissfully. Basically putting the Ten Commandments to music and to song, to be sung probably within the family, but also, of course, in the churches. In 1520, he wrote a work called Short Form of the Ten Commandments, the Creed and the Lord's Prayer, followed closely by his personal prayer book in 1522. These would be the seeds of what would later develop into his large and small catechisms of 1529 to 1530. A prayer book was, uh, by the late medieval period, was a traditional thing, and there were, of course, catechisms as well, but Luther does something different with his. He changes the order. He puts the commandments first. He puts the law first, and then the creed, and then the Lord's Prayer, so that people would see what they lack in the law, would go to the creed for forgiveness and mercy, and to the Lord's Prayer for help to do the will of God. And as we'll see, the catechisms that Luther writes later on were developed precisely in response to some churches that stopped preaching and teaching the Ten Commandments of the law in some of the Reformation churches in Germany. So Luther, from the very beginning, although speaking of the law negatively as it relates to our ability to keep it from justification, still expresses a vital importance of the Ten Commandments for the churches in knowing the will of God. Although at one point in his treatise on good works, he says, quote, a person living in this faith has no need of a teacher of good works. End quote. Sounds like Luther is saying there's no need for the law. But he's speaking only with regard to faith, which, born of the Spirit, does require no compulsion or instruction. But as we've already seen, for Luther, no person on earth this side of the resurrection lives perfectly in this faith, that paradox of the Christian as righteous and sinner. So some of these early statements by Luther would be quoted later by antinomians, but Luther, in other writings of the very same period, continues to emphasize that the ministry of the law continues in the present age, even though he does wish to put priority on the gospel. And again, this is why it's very important to interpret Luther by Luther. Against his Catholic opponent, Jerome Emser, Luther states that the law teaches the good works that God desires, that is its primary office. But the problem is that the law gives no power to the sinner to keep them. That was Israel's problem, and that was the reason Christ came to bring forgiveness, reconciliation with God, but also the Holy Spirit. In other words, the law prepared the way for the gospel, and it continues to do so as individuals are led from condemnation and repentance to faith in God's mercy. Luther will later refer to this as the law's chief or primary use to bring us to consciousness of sin that we might fall upon Christ. In his brief instruction on what to look for in the Gospels in 1521, Luther distinguishes between the way that Moses taught the law and the way Christ taught the law. Luther admits that Christ did not even surpass Moses or the Ten Commandments in teaching the basics of the law, so much as Christ taught the law and drew out its inner meaning and inner expectation more, such as in his Sermon on the Mount. Luther also says Christ does not drive and compel with threats and warnings, quite like Moses did, but rather he entreated his disciples as friends with love. Moreover, according to Luther, As I mentioned before already, Jesus' main purpose for coming was not to teach or preach the law, but to offer his life as a ransom for our failure to keep it. In fact, this is a major reason why Luther considered, uh, you know, the uh, oft-known phrase that Luther referred to the book of James as an epistle of straw. I'm surprised nobody asked that question yet. His kind of doubts about the canonicity of the book of James. But I think it's really important to understand that in light of this. First of all, uh, Luther had, um, you know, there was some doubts in the early church with regard to the canonicity. Eusebius, the, his, the historian uh, who wrote the history of the church, in his list of the books of the Bible, James is one of those that was still in dispute among some churches, along with Hebrews and some others. Fought because James was not an apostle, um, there was some question about it. But um, So Luther does, at one point in 1522, in his preface to the book, kind of expresses some doubts about its canonicity. He does later drop that. It's dropped out of the later editions of of the Bible after that, for good reason. But he always did kind of wrestle with its canonicity. Not because it taught the law and taught good works. He He praised it for that. He said it does a good job of teaching the law and the good works. The problem for Luther with James is that unlike the book of Romans or the gospel of 1 John, it does not teach the law and good works in context of a clear exposition of the gospel, as we know from the book of Romans that lays out the gospel at the beginning and then teaches what we are supposed to live, or even 1 John, 
James doesn't do that in Luther's estimation. It purely gives the law. It doesn't exposit the gospel. And so for him, if anything, the problem with James is it's belonging in the apostolic canon, especially if we think about the apostles' primary purpose was to preach the gospel, not to teach the law. So I think for Luther, he'd say, I'd be fine with a James, James in the Old Testament. But in terms of a New Testament book, it just, for him, it was difficult to reconcile with what he thought was the chief purpose of the New Testament to teach grace in the fulfillment of the law in Christ. So I think it's important to keep that in mind as Luther is trying to understand kind of the difference between the ministry of the law and the ministry of the gospel, and particularly with regard to the ages that precede and follow after Christ. In his preface to the German Pentateuch and his lectures on the book of Deuteronomy, coming from the early 1520s, Luther actually confronts those who, on account of the gospel, were disparaging the Old Testament because of an extremely negative view toward the law and its exclusive association with the Old Testament. So in other words, if we just preach gospel in the New Testament, it's almost like they could take Luther's ideas to an extreme and say, okay, we don't need the Old Testament anymore. That was just purely for Jews. Well, Luther readily acknowledges that the Old Testament taught grace. In fact, he describes Genesis as an exceedingly evangelical book in his preface to it. Furthermore, he recognizes that the New Testament itself contains many commandments in keeping with the law, which he describes as needful, quote, for the control of the flesh, since in this life the spirit is not perfected and grace alone cannot rule, end quote. Nevertheless, for Luther, each testament has its own proper office, and its chief teaching, the old is the office of the law and revealing of sin, and the new, the office of grace fulfilled in Christ. Luther did believe, of course, that certain ceremonial and civil laws of the Old Testament have been abrogated in the new Christian age, such as the commandment to destroy images in the land. His own colleague in Wittenberg, Andreas Bodenstein von Karlstadt, used Old Testament prohibitions against images, which led some to some destructive iconoclasm in Wittenberg, and Luther responded with two works, uh, two primary works, against the heavenly prophets in 1525 and how a Christian should regard Moses in 1526, in which Luther basically kind of defines the relationship of the Christian to the Old Testament. He says, whereas the moral law of the Ten Commandments agrees with natural law and applies to both Jews and Gentiles, other laws of the Old Testament, while perhaps useful for Gentile nations to consider, were only laid down as laws specifically for the Jewish people as conditions for the promised land. And the key law that the Jews talk about, other than the Ten Commandments, was the issue of interest, usury. Luther was very strongly against um, charging interest on loans to people, which was very very common during this time period. He uh, was very much against interest and seen a lot of the the Old Testament uh, negations to that. And he would say that is not... That was yes for the Jews with regard to their promised land, but it also agrees with the Ten Commandments and the natural law with regard to exploiting your neighbor. I would think that Luther would probably make a connection between usury and stealing, the law, thou shalt not steal. He thought it as an exploitation of that. So in that way, he could say a law that was given to the Jews with regard to usury still applies in the New Testament age. He was very much strong about that. Regardless, however, no law, whether ceremonial, civil, moral, natural, No law can justify any sinner before God. Luther says in his lectures on Deuteronomy, with regard to that future prophet promised in Deuteronomy 18.15, that Christ was coming as a distinctive prophet, not simply another lawgiver like Moses. Luther says Moses already taught the law, quote, to perfection in the Ten Commandments, and it was reaffirmed by other prophets, including John the Baptist. Jesus came uniquely as the fulfillment of the law, In Christ, the office of the law ceased, says Luther, but not in the sense that the moral law and the Ten Commandments must no longer be taught or kept, but the law no longer preaches its demands without any help, thereby merely increasing sin and increasing our condemnation. And of course, in Christ, the sting of that condemnation has been removed. For Luther, the proper understanding of law and gospel is to rightly part the hoof, he says, kind of an illusion or allegory of Deuteronomy 14 stipulations regarding clean and unclean foods. He also kind of uh, has an analogy or allegory with regard to the year of Jubilee. He says, while the gospel frees the sinner from condemnation and slavery to the law, just like the year of Jubilee freed slaves in Jewish law, such as Deuteronomy 15, 16, Luther says that believers, like the bondservants, choose to live by the law for obedience to their master 
Christ for the sake of their neighbor and account of the sinful nature. Just as some of those slaves, while they were free in the year of Jubilee, chose to remain under their beloved master. He says that's the kind of the way it works for the believer as well. Freed with regard to justification and yet submitting to the law because of their love for God. In fact, he says, uh, quote, Thus he, the believer, remains a slave and free man at the same time. End quote. So again, that, that paradox. While the office of Moses in the law could only reveal sin, the commandments of the New Testament, which agree in essence with the Ten Commandments, are preached with the gospel, Luther says, quote, to kill the remnants of the old man in the flesh, which is not yet justified, end quote. And though faith in Christ, quote, hastens of its own accord, end quote, the flesh and sinful nature continue to require that instruction and discipline of the law. This is why Jesus and the apostles of the New Testament teach many commandments, even though their special apostolic ministry is to preach the gospel. Luther later describes these in his lectures on Galatians as, quote, expositions of the law taught in a friendlier way. So lastly, let's talk about the period 1527 to 1539 before I wrap up and just summarize this. During visitations to the new evangelical German churches beginning in 1527, it became apparent that the pastors needed more adequate training, among other things. Luther's friend Philip Melanchthon drew up some visitation articles uh, after the visits, after studying, going out to the churches and just kind of seeing how the Reformation was progressing and, and proceeding. And one of the things that Philip Melanchthon brought back was a, an observation that the law was not being preached. The Ten Commandments were no longer being taught, preached. There was no longer the fear of God being taught and no longer repentance under the law, which both Melanchthon and Bel- Luther believed was necessary. As I mentioned, John Agricola, who is pastor of Eisleben and a friend of Luther. In fact, Luther, at one point, he says, I had him at my table. We were good friends, and now... You know, we disagree on this very issue, and they never reconciled. He resisted Melanchthon's articles. He argued that the preaching of the law for repentance, that belongs to the old age of the old covenant of Moses, now replaced by the new covenant of the gospel. In some manner, taking Luther's very words to their extremes that Luther did not intend, and excluding the preaching of the law entirely in the churches, just preaching grace, just preaching gospel, thus becoming known as antinomians against the law. Well, those visitation articles were edited by Luther, and he provided a preface, and they published them in 1528 as instructions for the visitors. So here's the visitation articles. Now Luther prepares the the instructions for the visitors as they go out. This is kind of how they were supposed to teach and prepare and train and equip these newly emerging... Because You have to think about the, the, the changes these churches were going through in terms of their theology and their practice and their worship... And so uh, Luther, Melanchthon, and leaders of the Reformation are seeking for ways to try and help that transition in terms of properly teaching them. Preach the gospel, yes, but you still also need to teach the law. You still need to preach the law as well. Of course, the instructions clearly state the commandments of Christ agree with the law of the Ten Commandments. So the law of commandments still apply because Christ himself taught them as well. The preaching of the law is certainly necessary for the unregenerate and the prideful in the churches to bring them to repentance. But repentance does not end with justification by faith, but continues on in the life of the believer who still needs the law to hold their, quote, carnal nature in check, end quote, is what the instructions say. And this is the seeds of what Melanchthon himself were first identified in the late 1520s and early 1530s as the third use of the law. The church just uses legis, the special function of the law in the life of the of the Christian. In lectures on Isaiah, about the same period, late, late 1520s, Luther says that the, quote, the law is no longer outrageous in its dictates, but an agreeable companion. The law itself indeed is not changed, but we are, end quote. And then his lectures on 1 Timothy, around the same time, he says, quote, to the Christian, the law is most sacred, end quote. So very positive statements about the law, right, for the believer. However, he says, That is, it's sacred if it's not misused. The misuse is, quote, when I assign to the law more than it can accomplish. Good works are necessary, and the law must be kept, but the law does not justify, end quote. For Luther, that was a very important distinction to make. Yes, the law is sacred, but it does not justify. 
The instructions and antinomian controversies serve as the backdrop for Luther's preparation of his catechisms in 1529-1530. Back in 1525, Luther had already intended to write a catechism. As I mentioned, his personal prayer book and that other, uh, other work, that short form of the um, commandments, the creed, the creed in the Lord's Prayer, 1520, the, the catechisms really just kind of follow that same structure and similar format. But the crisis of antinomies in the late 1520s urged Luther to get the catechism out, that it was really needed for the German parishes to, to serve as instructional aids to equip emerging evangelical pastors and as well the evangelical education of Lutheran families and children. Luther in the large catechism specifies the Ten Commandments are necessary to preach in churches, to establish the knowledge of right and wrong for the common order of society. Quote, no matter whether he is a believer or at heart a scoundrel or knave, end quote. The, the, the law is to be preached for the farmers, for shopkeepers, for household servants and children to teach them that God blesses obedience and he also judges and disciplines disobedience. He extols the Ten Commandments in the large catechism. Listen to the words that he says. Anybody who thinks that Luther only had a negative view of the law has not read the large catechism. Quote, anyone who knows the Ten Commandments perfectly knows the entire scriptures, he says. A summary of divine teaching on what we are to do to make our whole life pleasing to God. Apart from these Ten Commandments, no deed, no conduct can be good or pleasing to God. End quote. Luther knew that in our sinful nature, we invent works, we invent laws, we invent commandments, and thereby seek to please God. Luther says, it's all there, above all in the Ten Commandments, and as expounded by Christ and the apostles. Luther didn't even consider himself a master of his own catechism. (laughs) He viewed meditation daily on it as a means of resisting the devil, and that included meditation on the law, the Ten Commandments. Not only what the Ten Commandments prohibit, but also what they imply, and as Christ brought it out. It's not just enough, well, I haven't stolen from my neighbor. Luther draws out the implication that we are to do good to our neighbor, to seek their welfare, to help them, not just the prohibition against stealing, but also the heart of the law in terms of serving the neighbor's need. Luther had continued to attack antinomianism in the 1530s, including in his now revised lectures on Galatians. Listen to what he says in his lectures on Galatians. Maybe this, is the, maybe this is the one quote John Wesley read and then maybe didn't read further, I don't know. He says, quote, The highest art and wisdom of Christians is not to know the law, to ignore works and all active righteousness, end quote. If you end it there, you'd say, Luther doesn't have any, a very positive view of the law at all. It's completely done away with. But you have to keep reading because he quickly qualifies this by saying that this is coram deo before God. That is when we are to not to know the law, to ignore works and all active righteousness. In regard to our passive righteousness before God and the conscience, there is only faith in its union with Christ. For Luther, discerning the correct distinction of law and gospel is to be a, quote, real theologian. He thought that this was very important. We talked already uh, the other night about those two ditches. You know, on the one hand, the, the Catholic works on, uh, emphasis upon works and legalism and the antinomian ditch. And that's why Luther, for him, the balance of law and gospel was so important to be a real theologian, to understand that. And it was sure always a difficult task, especially when you have a congregation who might be mixed of people that are troubled about their salvation and those who are, you know, lax morally and just kind of whatever. But you have to preach the law and gospel and allow the Spirit to work on each. Right? Luther often talked, too, about that humans are just kind of like a drunk man on a horse. You know, they kind of fall off one side, they get up on the horse, and they fall off on the other side. It's a pretty good analogy, I think, of, of who we are as people. He says, quote, There is a time to hear the law and a time to despise the law. There's a time to hear the gospel and a time to know nothing about the gospel. Let the flesh and the old self permit itself to be disciplined and vexed by the law. Let the law prescribe to this what it should do and accomplish and how it should deal with other men. But let the law not pollute the chamber in which Christ alone should take his rest and sleep. End quote. I just love that. In the context of these lectures, Luther introduces his double use of the law. It's a quote, double use of the law. That is the civic use that restrains and binds the wicked and the theological or spiritual use that leads 
sinners and unbelievers to repentance, serving, quote, as a minister in preparation for grace. He says, the law by itself can only drive a person to despair under its accusations. If all we preached the law, you will have nothing but despairing people if they truly understand it. Because it can only go so far and it can go no further. If the law only makes its demands and gives no help, provides no way either for our forgiveness or for our ability to handle it, then we are, we are enslaved to it. We are to be pitied under God's condemnation. The law by itself. That's why law always has to be preached with gospel. Whenever Paul speaks of the condemnation of sinners under unwilling slavery to the law, it's this second use he's referring to with respect to those who are not yet justified. But after justification, then what? Not only did Christ and the apostles themselves teach commandments in accordance with the law, which Luther reiterates in his sermons on the Gospel of John in the late 1530s, Luther says the believer lives in between, quote, the time of law and the time of grace. And believer, this is a time of constant alternation every day. The law continues to convict of sin, the need for repentance, even increasingly, but Luther says, quote, it's not to harm, it's to save, end quote. On account of the flesh, the world, and the devil, the conviction of sin, the discipline of the flesh by the law continues so long as we remain sinners, which he says, quote, is the daily mortification of the flesh, the reason and our powers, and the renewal of our mind, end quote. At the same time, the believer continues to take hold of his justification in Christ by faith, quote, more perfectly day by day, quote. Luther states in his lectures on Genesis, delivered about the same time as the publishing of a work against the Antinomians in 1539, and Luther actually refers to a, his friend Agricola by name in the lectures. So be very, very careful what you say, I guess, right? You might end up in somebody's uh, sermon or lecture in a negative way. He says, quote, The true saints who are righteous through faith in the Son of God have the sinful flesh which must be mortified by constant chastening, end quote. This is why for Luther... The preaching of the law and even the wrath of God can serve true believers as a reminder too, quote, lest they yield to sin, which still adheres to them and to their natural weakness, end quote. So there continues to be a role for the law, and yea, a positive one for the believer with regard to his ongoing repentance. For Luther, there is no idea of, I repented long ago. <laughs> I made my repentance, and now, you know, I just kind of live my life. It's a daily Mortification. It's a daily repentance, that daily law and gospel experience. Although Melanchthon is the first to formally and explicitly identify, quote, a third use of the law for believers in his work, Commonplaces, Luther praises the work. He says, if you want to read about law and gospel, read Melanchthon's work, Commonplaces. And Melanchthon's own definition follows that of Luther in applying the law to those who are regenerate, free of the law's condemnation through faith, yet who need the law's prescription, chastening, and discipline on account of the flesh. The later Lutheran theologian, Martin Chemnitz, in his commentary on Melanchthon's work, Commonplaces, he ascribes to Luther's Galatians the origins of this unique third function of the law for the justified believer. This is echoed in Article 6 of the Lutheran Formula of Concord in 1577, an important confessional document of which Chemnitz was a principal author. Chemnitz reiterates Luther's twofold use of the law for the not yet justified, and then basically equates Luther's description of the unique role of the law in the justified believer with Melanchthon's definition of a third use of the law. Acknowledging that although on account of faith in the Spirit, the justified Christian requires no prescriptions, commands, or threats, yet on account of that thing called the sinful nature of the flesh, obedience does not come as freely, naturally, and spontaneously as a good tree brings forth its good fruit. Luther perceived there, and many other scholars, however they decide to call it, whether they want to call it a third use of the law or not, many agree that there is an important difference, and even in Luther, between the uses of the law and the not yet justified, and a special one in those who are justified, though on account of their sinful nature and its need for discipline and mortification and guidance and instruction. So some concluding thoughts, just to wrap some of this all up. Luther viewed the law as both a friend and a foe. It's a foe when it only demands works and provides no grace, no help to do them, which is to leave the sinner in bondage and under the wrath and condemnation of God. And for them, that, for Luther, that's, I think, how he viewed people preaching the law in his time period. Preaching the law without sufficiently preaching the gospel 
that provide them a way out through forgiveness and reconciliation with God and also provided true help to do that. But it left people in a cycle of bondage and slavery to the law, continued to try and achieve it in their own strength. If you preach the law and press the law without preaching the clarity of the gospel, you'll keep people in sin and in bondage and under the wrath of God. It can be a foe in the life of the believer when it accuses the conscience to the point of despairing of God's mercy, as if we are to be justified by the law and not by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. So there certainly is a work of the Holy Spirit that, is, that convicts believers when they go astray, that chastens them. But if we let it get to the point of despairing of God's mercy, and maybe some of you have been here before, where you've sinned and done something, you say, God could never forgive me for what I've done for that. Luther would say, that is to despair of God's mercy. That is to allow the law to go further than it should. It should convict us, yes. It should reprove us and chasten us. But it should not despair, make us despair of God's mercy as if our justification is by the law. The law is also a glorious, holy thing, revealing the will of God and the works that are well-pleasing to him. You've seen how Luther extolled the glorious and beauty, uh, glory and beauty of the Ten Commandments of God. The law of the Ten Commandments restrains the sins of the wicked and unregenerate. I think it was, was it you, Dr. Piper, I think, that said we should thank God for that, <laughs> for his common grace, right? Yeah. The fact that God does that and allows the law to be used in that sense, if only that sense, is still a good thing for the common order of society. It also humbles sinners to repentance. Again, that primary use of the law for Luther, that they might be prepared to believe upon Christ, be forgiven, and made alive by grace, justified. But it's a special friend. It's a special friend to the believer who has the Spirit on account of that flesh and sinful nature that we oppose, that we don't like, that we do not consent to fully in our hearts. He says it's a friend because it directs us in the good works that God approves and convicts and chastens us for our good, that we might daily mortify sin, obey the law out of reverence to God and to our neighbor. Luther would often say, God does not need our works. Our neighbor does. That's why we should do them. Sure, we glorify God by our works, but he has no need for our works. Our neighbor in need has need of our works. That's why we should do them. And so on account of that flesh, that sinful nature, and as the spirit is awakened within us, that conflict is there. And I think in some ways that's an evidence that you're regenerate and you're born again. Is there a conflict? Do you feel the war, the warfare between the promptings on the one hand and yet your disregard for those promptings? You don't like them. You wish they were gone. And in some ways, that's what we should be looking forward to, I think, in our future in heaven, is no longer having the oppositions and sinful promptings. We will be pure. That is the heart and the desire of a believer who possesses the Holy Spirit. Not perfection, but a longing for that day, and perfection will come. Well, the law of the Ten Commandments preaches more like a whip. The commandments of Jesus and the apostles affirm the substance of the Ten Commandments, exhorting the justified in a friendlier way, as Luther says, though still on account of the sinful nature. All the while, the believer relies fully on Christ alone for his justification before God throughout this life and prior to to his resurrection into the next, where faith at last will become sight, when our natures at last will be conformed perfectly and spiritually to the will of God revealed in the law. And just to, uh, just to wrap up, and to finish, these last words attributed to Luther, I think, are appropriate. He says, quote, So when the devil throws your sins in your face and declares that you deserve death and hell, tell him this, I admit that I deserve death and hell. What of it? For I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, Son of God, and where he is, there I shall be also.